although I think you may not think that Jordan himself is going to try Jesus smuggling on you, you fear that somewhere down the line from what he's saying, somebody else will do that trick. Yeah, it's, it's worse than that. I actually ah. know the people, the, the people who are clapping are doing that. I hear from those people on a daily basis, right? So the, the segment of Jordan's audience that is, that is very happy to be told they can stay on the riverbank of their traditional Christianity for the most part, and they don't have to get into the stream of totally modern, rigorous, rational thinking about everything from first principles, right? That there's something that, that the Iron Age scribes got right, and it's right for all time. Those are the, those are the applause I'm hearing. But and and, and I, I, however consciously or not, Jordan is telling them it's okay to stay, stick okay. right there with a, with a shard of the cross. Okay, well, in, in Dublin, I, I actually tried a little conscious Jesus smuggling on Sam to see how that would go in a discussion we had about the central archetype of superheroes, but I'm going to try something a little different tonight. I'm going to try a little direct God smuggling. We won't bother with Jesus. Let's go right to God. Why not? So, um, one of the things I've really tried to do when I've been analyzing religious texts is to take them as to take them seriously in the sense that I don't presume that I understand them and I presume that they're a mystery of sorts and at least the Bible for example is a mystery because we don't really understand the processes by which it was constructed and we don't understand the processes by which we all agreed collectively over several thousand years to organize the book the way it way it is organized or to edit it the way that it's edited or to, and to keep what's in it and to and to discard what's not in it and why it's lasted and why it's had such a huge impact. We, well, I, I we, don't want to der derail you but yeah. uh, we, we do understand that the first part of the process all too well. We know that the, this, there was a political and all too human process of voting certain texts in for inclusion and some were in for centuries and then got jettisoned and, and, sure. and Revelation came in far later than, I mean, there, there were whole generations of Christians who lived and died under the banner of the Bible, yes. and it was a different Bible at the time. Of they course, had the wrong Bible. So well, but it's, it's the same. It's the same issue that, that we really don't dis, we really don't understand. F fair enough, Sam. And I'm uh, not saying that political etc. considerations didn't enter into it. I'm sure all human considerations entered into it. But there was some collective process of winnowing, and you can attempt to reduce that to economic or political causes, which is generally what secular. Um, assessors like Freud and Marx both did, and with a fair degree of success, I might add, but there's still some mysterious uh, assessment of what it is that will be remembered that entered into it, but it's, it's a separate point to, to some degree. I'm just saying that my point, my, my, my point of departure when looking at these texts is one of an essential radical ignorance. I don't assume that I understand the mechanisms by which they were generated or edited or collected or kept or remembered or why they had the impact they had. Now, I've been thinking a lot about the idea of, let's say, God the Father because that's a very common archetypal representation of God, God the Father. So I'm going to tell you an experience that I had that I've never really told any audience about. Um, I had a vision at one point that and the vision had to do with a dialogue that I was having with my father. And, you know, you have a father, right? And when you're a little kid, you act out your father when you pretend to be a father. And what you're doing when you're acting out your father isn't imitating your father because you don't duplicate precisely the actions that your father ever took in his life. What you do is you you watch your father across multiple contexts and you abstract out something like a spirit of the father and then when you're a child you implement that spirit of the father in your pretend play and you come to embody that deeply so the notion is that people can abstract out something like a spirit of the father and that that's part of our mimet mimetic tendency which is a very powerful human cognitive tendency and in this vision I first started to talk with my father and I would say more with the spirit of my father because he wasn't actually there and I would say it was the wisest part of him and then that sort of transformed into a discussion that I had with a series of ancestral spirits and then that transformed itself into a vision of God himself with whom I had a conversation and this was a visionary experience 
And then that all went away, and I spent months and months thinking about it, and I thought, so you guys can tell me what you think about this, and this sort of stretches my cognitive ability to, to its utmost limit to contemplate such things, but here's a biological argument. I already made the case that a child can extract out the spirit of the father and embody it, and that's necessary insofar as you're going to be a father and a wise one, but we can also extract out the spirit of the father over much longer periods of time because my father was a father because he imitated his father who imitated his father who imitated his father as far back in time as you can go and there's a cumulative development of the spirit of the father across time now then the question might be does this spirit of the father have any reality other than the metaphorical and I would say damn right it has a reality and I can describe a biological reality and and, and I don't know what this says about any background metaphysics, but here's a hypothesis. We know that human beings separated from chimpanzees over the course of the last seven million years, at least in large part because of human female sexual selectivity. So it was the spirit of femininity collectively that helped elevate us to the degree that we have been elevated above our chimpanzee co-ancestor. But here's something interesting to contemplate. What is it precisely that makes men, what makes men desirable to women? And so I have a bit of a hypothesis about that. So here's what men do. They get together in productive groups and they orient themselves toward a certain task. And they produce a hierarchy around that task because whenever you implement a task, you produce a hierarchy. And they vote up the most competent men to the top of the hierarchy. And then the women select the competent men from the top of the hierarchy. But the vote that determines who the competent men are that are more likely to reproduce is a consequence of male evaluation of men, and that's occurred over millennia. And so there's a spirit of the father that's embedded in the patriarchal hierarchy that acts as the primary selection mechanism that offers men up to women and plays a, a cardinal role in human evolution. And it looks like we've we've personified that spirit of the father in our religious imagery and and that's that's how it looks to me but then there's something that's even more mysterious and deep about that that's worth considering is that apparently the entire course of evolutionary history has conspired to produce human beings and we could argue that it could have been different but it certainly hasn't been different and that means that that selective spirit of the father has been part of the process that's generated our very being and it's certainly possible that that collective spirit of the father reflects mm. something metaphysically fundamental about the structure of reality itself uh, wait I, w I was you with you up until the last sentence yes <laughs> well in so, insofar as I agree with with virtually all of that I should say that none of that should give comfort to people who want to hold on to this notion that certain of our books might have been revealed by the creator of the universe. Right? Well, it depends on what you mean by the creator. Yeah. Like, well, well, I'm just saying that, that, that the world we're living in now is one in which we have whole societies shattered over this notion that some books weren't written by human beings. Right? There's, there's a different class of book. Right? There's a different shelf in the library where the, the products of uh, almost certainly merely human brains are venerated for all time and, and considered uneditable and unignorable by, by the majority of human beings. Yeah, well, and it's, it's clear, clear that revelation can devolve into but, fundamentalism but, 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 but and that that's but, a real but any, yeah, but, problem. The, the, the very, Sam, but, so uh, there is a risk in all this always. It's, it's an often made critique, yeah. but that when you're talking about religion, you're talking about the Inquisition, you're talking about the jihadists, you're not talking about somebody who wants to go to their local Anglican church once a year, maybe get the children into school, and maybe when they're at some desolate moment of their lives returns to this as a place that stores meaning. I mean, the thing that I think Jordan and I are in agreement on in this is, is that thing, I uh, quote from Schopenhauer in the dialogue on religion when he says, you know, the truth may be like water, it needs vessels to carry it. And we, when we were talking about this the other night, you know, you admitted that one of the consequences, perhaps, of the, you know, the, the parents sort of going through the belief structures they may not believe in anymore, but they keep doing it is a demonstration of what you said was the, the, you know, the non-embarrassing options that atheists have come up with. Mm. But it may also be that, that since we don't have very many vessels that cracked and 
damaged and sometimes transparent as they are, what vessels you have might be worth holding on to. Well, no, I think, I think the challenge here is, I mean, it, it feels that, well, for, first of all, we should first notice that these comments very often take the form of, you and I don't need this stuff, but most other people do, right? And that is... Yeah, it, it, it can it, do that, yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, that's inevitably, and it, it, it sort of t took that form at one moment the other night, whereas where you acknowledge that that people of low intelligence are, are best placed in a conservative paradigm, a traditionally conservative par paradigm, because there's less to think through, right? Now, obviously, you don't want your, your view on religion su summarized by, it's good for stupid people. Well, but, I, do, I do want it summarized to some degree that way, because well, one of the things yes, we I'm, do... Yeah, I'm giving you not, the opportunity again to put well, this foot in your mouth. But, 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 but yeah. I, would only, I would say not, not only... I mean, the thing is, is that we're all stupid, and and some of us are far stupider than others. But, but we're not. But and we're not that stupid. I mean, well, well, <laughs> but what, well, there's another problem, Sam. I, yeah. I think, and 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 th this is obviously a contentious one. And one of the things I I don't go to church, but there is one thing I admire about the church, and that is that it's managed to serve as a repository for these fundamental underlying fictions for two millennia. And that's really something bloody unbelievable. I mean, the great, um, what would you say? It is bloody unbelievable. Well, look, yeah. Sam, yeah. Everything's, yeah. Everything's, everything's soaked in blood. We, we have no disagreement yeah. about that. But the yeah. secular alternatives that we produced in the 20th century were certainly no less blood sodden. But, and no, they produced nothing of any productivity all right, well then it, we, whatsoever. We, we, we did not do it now, but we have to put to bed that secular canard. What because would you it's, do? Well, it's, it's, just, it's just not so that... <laughs> Stalinism was the product of secularism or atheism, and nor were, nor were well, it was a product. It wasn't an inevitable no, no, no. product or it, the not, product. It, it, it wasn't. Ba and please, anyone who has this meme in in your head, please just allow the next sentences I speak to just push it out because it's, I'm so sick of hearing this. Uh, this this idea that the greatest crimes of the 20th century were somehow the product of atheism. Right. This, when you look at what actually engineered these atrocities, it was something that looked very much like a religion. It was a religion in every way apart from an explicit commitment to otherworldliness. It was based on that, that's a big do difference. dogmatism through and through. It was based on a personality cults that, that grew up around figures like Stalin and Hitler and Mao. Uh, it's, these were, the, the, it was not the ideas of Bertrand Russell and David Hume brought us to the gulag or to Auschwitz. Yes, but then you it can't the, say it's the thought of Jesus Christ either. I mean, well, no, it's true. No, I can say that. I, I, I can say it was the thought of St. Augustine, and I can say it was the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas look, explicitly that gave us the Inquisition. This is, this is a fact. 